My name is Bill Dewey, 445th Bomb Group. I was a pilot, and uh, this photograph was taken after I got through with my tour when I was home on leave in Detroit in 1945. Okay, this picture is, uh, shows my original crew, uh, the enlisted men that flew with me. On the left is Ruben Monte Montanez, tail gunner, Walt Bartko, uh, Les Medlock, and uh, my radio operator, uh, uh, John Elson. <clears throat> Montanez and Bartko were both wounded on the Castle mission. Bartko was sent home after the Castle mission. Okay, this picture was taken March 24th, 1945, just before the, uh, the mission crossing the Rhine, dropping supplies to the troops low level. We practiced for two weeks flying over England at 500 feet. Uh, the man on the left is Roy Albergini, who is our pilotage navigator, and that's me on the right. Uh, and of course, as you see, we were not in our electric flying suits because we were going to be flying so low. That was rather a disastrous mission, by the way. The picture you see of Roy Albergini again, he was our pilotage navigator. He is a member of the 2nd Air Division, by the way, and has attended some of the conventions. Okay, this is Lieutenant Bill Mitchell, who was our bombardier when we were a lead crew from my 12th mission through my 30th mission. He flew with us, as did Roy Albergini. This is a B-24 taking off on a mission uh, from Tibbenham Air Base on the 445th field. This picture shows a formation of the 445th en route to Germany. This shows uh, another picture of the 445th, part of the formation en route to Germany, climbing. Here you see a typical uh, flak barrage that the 445th had to pass through. Uh, evidently we were throwing chaff that day because a lot of the flak is down below us. They don't have too good a beat on us, fortunately. It seems to be off to the left and down below. Uh, the plane on the left has been hit by flak and is on fire. You can see the fire coming out of the tail. It's on its way down. Uh, they, this uh, shows uh, the 445th dropping bombs. You can see bombs coming out of the bomb bay, especially on the plane furthest away. Coming back to the Tibbenham airfield over the runway, you can see that uh, the formation of uh, this particular squadron is peeling off. The first, the furthest plane to the left has, is banking and the idea was to make as tight a spiral as possible so that uh, the last plane cracking the whip can get on the ground as fast as possible, low on gas. Now here you see a B-24 of the 445th finally coming in for a landing after a mission, almost ready to touch down. Tell me how old you were when you joined and, and where you were from and why you joined. Okay, I, I joined uh, the Air Force, and I, I was brought in October 6, 1942. I uh, joined at, at Detroit, went through the Federal Building, and uh, 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 I was real eager to get in, and I was put in charge of a group of uh, uh, volunteers, and uh, 13 of us shipped to Fort Custer, and then that's where we got our uniforms. We were, we were enlisted men privates unassigned, and then shipped after a week at uh, Fort Custer to Jefferson Barracks, Missouri. We stayed there. Uh, 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 actually, the, the fellows that I enlisted with all went ahead to Nashville, to class, classification, and I got sick. I uh, almost died of pneumonia. I don't know if you've heard anything about Jefferson Barracks, but that was, uh, they called it Pneumonia Gulch. In fact, they closed it after the war because uh, it, uh, it was so, such a hellhole as far as disease was concerned. But I was on KP duty and uh, I got uh, pneumonia. As the weather changed, I was in a blizzard and I was carrying uh, 
trays from uh, the uh, dishwasher into the other part, and I had to go out on a uh, porch, and it was freezing cold, and uh, so they threw me in the hospital for two weeks, and my my guys all shipped out, and uh, eventually I was shipped out to Santa Ana, California, instead of Nashville. Now, if I'd gone to Nashville, maybe I wouldn't be here today. So uh, where did you get your wings? Uh, I went through the West Coast Flying Training Command, and went through uh, Santa Ana, and then Visalia, California, uh, Sequoia Field up in the uh, San Fernando Mountains, Bakersfield, Marfa, Texas, and then I, I was commissioned at Marfa, Texas, uh, second lieutenant. Tell us about your trip to Europe. Well, uh, after, uh, after crew training at Tonopah, Nevada, uh, we were shipped to Hamilton Field and then by train across country to Camp Miles Standish, Boston, Massachusetts, and we uh, were put on a convoy, and uh, two weeks later we arrived at Liverpool. We, it seems like we veered all over the, the Atlantic getting there, very slow. It was a slow boat. Uh, and then uh, we went through the usual process, the replacement center, and then we were shipped to North Ireland, Clunto, North Ireland, for a week's training in RAF-type uh, flying. And then from there, uh, they flew us directly from Clunto, North Ireland, to Tibbenham, 445th Bomb Group. We arrived there August 6, 1944. Went immediately into training as a crew and uh, flying practice missions and so forth. And I flew my first mission August 16, 1944. Tell us about your first mission. Well, uh, it was uh, scary. <laughs> Uh, at, yeah, actually, uh, I didn't know exactly how to act. I thought I was supposed to put my flak suit on right on the runway. I was that scared. But uh, we, uh, uh, our first mission happened to be to Dessau, Germany, and uh, it was deep in, uh, directly below Berlin, about uh, 100 miles. So it was a deep penetration mission, 2,700 gallons of gas, which was the maximum we could carry. Uh, we flew uh, a wing, of course, at that time, uh, uh, and uh, as a wing crew. And uh, uh, our, from the initial point of the bombing run to the target, we were uh, hitting a headwind of about 60 to 70 miles an hour at 22,000 feet. So it took us 15 minutes straight and, and level on the bomb run. And it, they, right along that uh, route was a railroad. And every sighting seemed to have 155 millimeter guns, and they were just, just, the flak was terrific. In fact, we lost four planes that day from our group from flak. What was your first impression of the flak? Well, this, this is the only, this is a part of the plane that, uh, that, 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 that was the way it looked. It was completely peppered. Uh, it was scary. I mean, it was popping right by our, uh, sure. This is what's left of, uh, of a plane that we later flew on that Castle mission. That was the plane that brought us back from Castle. That's the only thing I have left of it. After you came back from that mission, what was your perspective about the remaining missions? I don't think, I don't, I don't believe we thought too much about it. I mean, uh, and I know you were in the same situation, Joe. Uh, you had to do it. It was no question that we were just going to have to go up and fly and get those missions over as fast as possible. There was no question about, uh, and we were, fra uh, we were scared. <laughs> no question about that. Tell us about your next most difficult mission. Well, uh, another interesting mission we had was uh, on my, uh, I believe it was the fifth mission. We were starting out on a mission to Ham, Germany, and uh, we were Climbing in formation made, made landfall over the coast of uh, Holland, and we started to lose oil pressure on, on our number two engine. Uh, we couldn't get it to feather. It was windmilling. And we finally dropped out of formation. We had to uh, 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 salvo our bombs. Our navigator really didn't know where we were. I can say this because he's not here. I mean, he, he was killed later on. but. Uh, he had been looking at the schedule. We were supposed to make landfall at such and such a time, so he had no idea where we were when we dropped out of formation, but he got that G-box going. You remember that, Joe? 
And he, with the coordinates he found on the G-Box that we were somewhat placed in Belgium, over Belgium, we salvoed our bombs in what looked like an open field, and we headed for Paris. And this was September, I believe it was September 7th, 1944, and as you recall, Paris was just liberated about three days before. We found Paris, and the, the airfield that we picked out was Le Bourget, which, where Lindbergh landed. It was uh, the, nothing but craters on the runway, so we had to land on a 2,700-foot grass uh, field. By that time, the, the prop had stopped windmilling and frozen. So the co-pilot and I both had, got on those controls, and you know, there's quite a bit of yaw in one of those B-24s when you have one engine off. Uh, it tends to pull you one way or the other. And so we got her stopped and skidded most of the length of the runway. You had to put it down on the first third of the field. Normally, we landed on a, on a 6,000 foot runway. This was 2,700 foot. The uh, interesting thing was the uh, C-47s were, were flying wounded out of there. And uh, we came in with our uh, flares flying, red flares, indicating we had uh, emergency. And they, of course, we spent uh, three days in Paris. And not much fun because it was uh, at a time when all the utilities were off. There were no lights, no subways. They were still fighting in the streets. The French forces of the interior and the Maquis were still fighting, going into houses and shooting everybody up, uh, collaborators or anti-communists, whichever. So we took C-47 back and eventually all my crew reassembled and we started flying missions again and then we got on my, my eighth mission was the most difficult. Tell us about that mission. Well that was to the rail yards at Kassel, Germany. and. Uh, uh, and the, uh, <coughs> the, we went on, we crossed the enemy coast and it was a uh, solid undercast of clouds so we were navigating by pathfinder, by radar, and our, our group, the 445th, was leading the second combat wing. The 453rd was behind us and the 389th behind that. And for some reason the group lead radar navigator picked out the wrong town. The, uh, he picked out Gottingen instead of Kassel. And we deviated 30 degrees to the left while all the rest of the bomber stream was, was flying to the right. Uh, and so we were isolated. The fighter cover was, was all over the bomber stream. And when we dropped our bombs in group formation and turned up from the clouds down below came 120 German fighters. They were heading toward the main bomber stream, toward Castle. They just happened to run into us. And of course from below, uh, wingtip to wingtip, they came in 30 abreast just like a cavalry charge with their machine guns and cannon firing and just plowing through the uh, helpless B-24s. And fortunately, our particular position in the formation, we were at the left wing of the lead element of the high, high right. Four, four, uh, we had four squadrons. 35 planes dropped their bombs, and we happened to be spread way out because, as you recall, when you were uh, flying high, high right, or high right, you had a tendency to over The uh, tendency of uh, uh, flying at different altitudes, the higher altitude uh, squadron or group would tend to override the main group and, or main squadron. And so since we were the high, high right group, we were probably flying at some uh, possibly as high as 600 feet above the lead group. And so consequently, we had to S. We were all doing the same airspeed, but because you're up higher in altitude, you have a tendency to overrun. So we were s way off to the left, and I think it was a blessing for us because we were the last squadron to be attacked. So the FW-190s and ME-109s had plowed through the rest of their group and uh, were coming up to us in about at least five planes, for sure three ME-109s and, ME and FW-190s. So as these ME-109s and FW-190s closed in on us, our gunners, of course, were opening up on them. And uh, uh, two of the FW-190s exploded right in the faces of the waste gunners. Uh, the tail turret caught fire from hydraulic fluid. It shattered, and uh, uh, of course, this all this this entire battle took place in about three minutes. 
the obviously we had up in the cockpit didn't know what was going on because our intercom had gone out and so I asked the co-pilot to go back and check on it and uh, he came back in about uh, five ten minutes and said we are in critical condition both waste gunners were wounded uh, both seemed quite critically when it looked like they were dying the tail gunner had blood all over his face from the shattered uh, uh, tail turret and uh, there was a huge hole on the left side just ahead of the waste window big enough that when we finally landed they could actually take the people out through the side of the plane the two twin tails were as if a giant can opener had been taken on the trailing edge and just opened them up they were just shattered so the the cables were frayed back to the the control cables and uh, uh, on our right wing, uh, over the number three engine, there was a three-foot diameter hole where 100 octane gasoline was spilling out. Uh, evidently, these these German fighter pilots had been trained that our number three engine uh, was the hydraulic pump that had, had, had the hydraulic pump on it. So go for the number three, so because they had directed a lot of their fire at the at the number three. So. Uh, Evidently, one German plane had dropped down about 300 feet below, 200 to 300 feet, and our gunners could see it down there. It was waiting for our plane to go down. They couldn't believe we wouldn't go down, evidently. But uh, ten, this was about 10 minutes later, and a, uh, our nose gunner said there was a uh, fighter plane coming up at 11 o'clock low. It turned out to be a P-47, probably from the 9th Air Force, investigating the, all of the the planes coming down and on fire. So we had, uh, by that time, we were uh, uh, down to seven planes out of the 35 uh, in our formation. We couldn't keep up with formation at 160 indicated. Had to, uh, I had to call the leader, ask them to slow down, but they couldn't. So we dropped out of formation and I went to, to on the VHF distress radio channel D for distress and just as clear as crystal, the. Uh, we got Colgate Air Sea Rescue, and they vectored us in to Manston. But two hours later, we dropped down through the clouds over the English Channel, and there were those beautiful white cliffs of Dover and that long, long runway at Manston. And we landed, and by the grace of God, the uh, the all of the landing gear came down, and with all of that uh, ammunition, and and. Uh, uh, all, all the everything that the Germans could throw at us, we still had uh, fully inflated tires. All three tires were fully inflated. The hydraulic uh, worked perfectly. Full flaps made the best landing I ever made as a B-24 pilot, just like on feathers. What was your reaction to that mission as you uh, were going through all those difficulties? Uh, I'll, t I'll tell you, Joe. It, it, I prayed to God more than I ever prayed in my life, before or after. And uh, very honestly, as I'll say later on too, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that I uh, had the greatest feeling of peace and tranquility came over me. I, it was as if uh, the plane was on robot, as if I was just an instrument flying that back. All the fear left me. And it was the only time in my flying experience that I ever had that happen. I just have to say it was because of prayer. Can you tell us what you want the world and history to remember about your contribution to the war effort? Well, I think uh, the American people should realize the sacrifice that all of these young men went through. Uh, we we fought for freedom. We uh, we were. We were told that we were fighting for the four freedoms and that uh, to this, this would be the, another war to end all wars, and uh, uh, it's, it, it just has not worked out that way. I think that uh, what we did was out of, uh, uh, I think we were purely patriotic, but we were fighting for what we thought was right and for right and freedom. You know what you did for the war. What did the war do for you? I think the, uh, the Air Force, the military experience made a man out of me. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. It changed my life for the better. It was a wonderful experience. What have you been doing since the war? 
Uh, I went to, uh, back to school after the war, at, uh, graduated from University of Michigan with a business administration degree, and I'm now an executive recruiter, have my own company, I work with my son, and we, we now recruit for the real estate development and uh, construction industries, project managers, estimators, executives. But this experience, and then of course I was made a lead crew afterward, because there were so few pilots, they had to choose some of us. I became a lead crew and then a, an assistant group operations officer, briefing officer. All that experience was invaluable. As you look back over 50 years later, what stands out as the single most significant memory of the war? I think the Castle mission. That any of us that flew on that or, or participated in it, you couldn't describe uh, what was happening that day. What were your feelings toward the Germans uh, during the war and uh, after the war? Great respect. I never had any hate for the Germans at all. I always felt that they were doing their job and if I had been born in Germany, I would probably be flying for the Luftwaffe. So uh, I had no, uh, I, I just had no feeling of animosity toward them. Why should today's children uh, know about the efforts of the 2nd Air Division and about pilots and other crew members who flew B-24s and the ground crew? Well, I think they should realize uh, what this country stands for and uh, have a, a sense of history. I'm afraid we've lost that, whether it's due to the schools or the television media or whatever, but we don't have a patriotism like we did. And, what we fought for really was the concept of this Constitution and the uh, Declaration of Independence. It's, this is a country like no other, where our uh, rights come to us directly from our divine creator, not from a president, not from a dictator, not from a king, but directly from God. And uh, this is the only country with a Constitution like that in the world. And that's what we fought for.
Thank you, George, and thank you for doing such an outstanding job of <coughs> conducting our reunion here. We appreciate it. You all may be seated, please. I'll remain standing. Life and freedom. Thou who hast brought to us the creation of the earth and the creation of life, thou who hast given man dominion over the earth, over the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea. How excellent is thy name in all the earth, O Lord. Thou who hast, why art thou so mindful of man? But thou hast made him but little lower than the angels, and hast given him the dominion over the earth that we appreciate. We ask that thou wilt bless us as we gather here, shed the light of thy grace upon us, and grant us joy. Bring us health and strength, we pray. We ask that thou will bless the food we are going to receive, that it may sustain us in our needs. Help us to live our lives here on earth as thou wouldst have us live, so that we may join with thee. Right.